Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled The Evolution of Patient Assistance Programs. My name is Amanda Norris and I'm the Associate Content Manager for Health Leaders and your moderator for today's webinar. Today's program is sponsored by Cardinal Health. Thank you to our sponsor and to you and our audience for giving us your time and attention. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. Note that an on-demand version of this program will be available approximately one day after the completion of the event and can be accessed by using the same login link that you use for the live program. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping details. First, to ensure that you can see all the content for the event, please maximize your event window and be sure to adjust your computer volume settings and or PC speakers for optimal sound quality. Second, you will find a resources list for today's webinar in the lower right side of your screen. Here we have listed the webinar slide deck and other materials from our supporter for you to interact with. Third, at the bottom of your console are multiple widgets you can use. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is likely that your questions will not be answered until the Q&A portion of the program. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's program and need assistance, please click on the help widget, which has question mark icon and covers common technical issues. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's presentation. We have Laura McIntyre Hansel, the Director of Revenue Cycle Development at Cardinal Health, and Anthony Sanders, the Director of Medication Assistance at Cardinal Health. Thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction. So today's presentation is entitled The Evolution of Patient Assistance Programs. In today's presentation, Anthony and I will be providing overview and discussion as to why standard practices today are no longer meeting today's industry needs, as well as looking into the evolution of traditional patient assistance programs. And finally, looking at what results are possible and how to get started. My name is Laura McIntyre. I'm the Director of Revenue Cycle Development with Cardinal Health. I'm a nurse by training. I've dedicated the last two decades to streamlining efficient efficiencies surrounding the line of sight to the remit process and the application of holistic advocacy approach in multiple sites of care across our healthcare space. Good day, everyone. My name is Anthony L. Sanders, and I'm the Director for Medication Assistance with Cardinal Health. I spent the better part of the last two decades in healthcare, with the last 15 years focused exclusively on patient assistance programs and financial advocacy. I specialize in helping health systems and hospitals reduce uncompensated care and patients gain access to medication and other forms of financial sponsorship. For me, my first introduction to PAP came when my youngest son was born and I really didn't have any health insurance. So a small clinic close to us was able to help me and my family. And from that point, I was sold on PAP. So I got my uh, first start right around the arrival of 340B. Um, everyone uh, was expecting that PAP was going to go away with the introduction of 340B, but we found it wasn't going away. PAP was simply changing. And then so a few years later, uh, we come to the implementation of ACA. And again, everyone thought PAP was going away, but what we learned is, again, PAP wasn't going away, it was simply changing. There were still uninsured patients, self-paid patients, and major gaps in benefits. And so I've had the pleasure really to participate as PAP sort of grew up. And so I really want to thank you for having me today. And so, Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick things off. Thanks so much, Anthony. So let's start today's discussion off by reviewing really why the standard practices that we find today are falling short of today's industry needs. So in looking at this, today's standard practices are no longer meeting our industry needs. 
Many hospitals and health systems truly feel that denied and rejected claims are unavoidable. The reality, and just a reality of providing health care, one that fuels revenue loss and consumes expensive manpower to overcome with often very little payoff. Laura, that's, that's actually a really good point. Um, two out of every 10 claims are facing denials. And there's a common thread in the causative factors, the payers. So understanding plan coverages, issues around uh, coordination of benefits, medical documentation, and lack of medical necessity. Each one of these really dictates our path for identifying and even recognizing advocacy. Well, you know, Anthony, you hit on one of the very key points in this, is you talked about medical documentation, issues surrounding coordination of benefits. These are some of the causative factors that we really see that industry average knows that 10% of initial claims face rejection and denial. Now, nothing here says that back-end standard practices aren't recovering up to two-thirds of these. But that really comes at a price. That price is in the form of delayed revenue recognition, increased administrative burden, and often rehandling and resubmission of these claims. But additionally, I challenge us to look at what percentages of these practices are garnering success. What I want to truly highlight here is even though we can recapture two thirds of these rejected and denied claims, through standard back-end practices, what about that one-third of claims that are really unrecoverable? They result in an inflation of uncompensated care. A hundred percent of all of the retroactive analytics really can't change the problems that have already occurred. Now, at best, we can course correct for future, but again, we can't go back and change what happened. But to come back to center on all of these areas that we're discussing, these are opportunities to have actionable impact to many of the areas that are contributing to bad debt and uncompensated care across our spectrums. And they're often not supported in line of sight to pay or remit in really what's an ever-changing environment. So let's talk about um the status quo, um, high cost inefficiencies. There's an, uh, an industry standard. It came out right around 2021. On average, every denied claim receives five to seven touches before any type of change can be reached. So, you know, just thinking about that, I can't even begin to imagine the wages, the investment in those activities. What's the percentage of return on that investment? especially in a workplace that's already staffed strapped. So often revenue cycle doesn't have the bandwidth to wear more than one hat in the day. Um, I want to take this just a bit further, um, this in industry study. Um, CEOs tend to categorize claim issues into four categories. Number one, coding errors. Number two, medical necessity issues. When you think about that, many of the standard front-end practices don't review medical necessity outside of the bounds of prior authorizations. So that leaves the facility at risk. Then number three, we, we start talking about uh, clinical validation denials, that uh, when the chart uh, doesn't uphold the diagnosis that's used for the service. And then number four, um, talking about those front-end issues when, when you're sitting with the patient, there's a large percentage of denials that have their root cause, and it's found in registration practices that may not produce accurate insurance data. But all of that said, what many may not realize, these triggers for rejected and denied claims, they're really just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other factors that play a role, and really understanding these factors that's just the first step in not only mitigating, but improving uh, these processes. So Laura, can you talk about that uh, just a little bit more? Absolutely. So 
let's begin to explore what are these breakdowns in the approval process. Some of these weren't in our environment five to seven to nine years ago. This is part of that change in healthcare. We see site to care shifts where we are being pushed by payers into non-hospital based infusions, requiring freestanding infusion sites or even home infusion. Looking at say step therapies by payers, the requirement to try and fail certain medications before going on to others, these are often unclear in the authorization or pre-screening process. Obviously looking at things like medical necessity that often feels like a moving target. Questions around these coding queries, medical necessity, not even beginning to look at the white bag or clear bag opportunities or in times that we as a facility don't have the right to buy and build. Multiple stakeholders, numerous handoffs, every one of these areas that I'm talking about here are completely outside of the bounds of formal prior authorization process and are often hurdles that are put in our way to that recognition or what I call line of sight to remit. So an industry kind of study um, looking at here is really the impact of high treatment cost. 47 year old patient that was treated with Remicade. Insurance coverage, they had a commercial PPO. Pre-screening was done and prior authorization was required or not required and obtained. Remicade was on formulary, but when that claim was processed, it was identified that the patient insurance had contracted received through specialty pharmacy, through PBM. The facility did not have the right or was not permitted to buy and bill this medication. So the result in this is the first three infusions were denied as not covered. It was a cost of $1,500 per dose by purchase price of that medication. Now the facility now had course corrected and is receiving medication via a special pharmacy to administer to the patient, but it takes a lot of office visits and follow-up care to compensate for the loss of that dosage price that there is no avenue to recoup. That's interesting. Um, you know, we, just thinking about this, a, a breakdown in approvals, that, that's also going to impact your advocacy, meaning advocacy hinges on insurance paying their portion. So we can get 100 copay cards, we can get 1,000 copay cards, but those copay cards don't matter much if insurance doesn't pay its portion. Uh, Anthony, you couldn't be more correct. You know, as Laura and I have been sharing, every rejected claim receives five to seven touches before a change can be made. And as you can see on this slide, uh, that's an average of $181 in wages just to correct one of these issues, just one, $181. So let's talk about why these breakdowns happen. Believe it or not, how quickly they can happen. But to do that, First, let's reframe how we look at this. Forget, forget the rat race. It's really a relay race. And I want you to think about this for a moment. What if the doctor ordered Remicade? And what if the nurse prior authorized Inflectra? But when it gets to the pharmacist, the formulary alternative is Epsola. So we order that, not realizing the prior authorization the nurse got was for the reference drug. But then scheduling at patient intake, the financial counselor granted for the reference drug that the doctor ordered. So by the time it gets to coding, you have three different drugs, two diagnoses, and an advocacy that doesn't match. And, and this happens all the time, the relay race. Real life situation, real life scenario. While we were doing an assessment for a potential customer, we encountered a situation where the doctor um, has been treating with the patient. The hospital made a formulary decision for a biosimilar. So all the medications were transitioned to this particular biosimilar. Nursing authorized the reference drug because that's what the doctor had put in her order. 
So pharmacies ordering on formulary requirements by the payer as an indication. We're scheduled for the drug, coding has done its job, but when it comes to billing, it was ordered for a drug that didn't have the indication to uphold it. And all of that resulted in about 2.4 million billable that was lost. It's a relay race. Everyone is running at full speed, but you think about processes, workflows, payer requirements, all the changes around healthcare itself can so easily become disjointed that dollars are being lost. So as we know, patient assistance programs have historically been a way to mitigate and even stop dollars being lost. But again, as I talked about in my introduction, healthcare continually changes. It continually evolves. And so with that evolution comes new requirements, new challenges, and even new territory that traditional uh, approaches to patient assistance programs, um, they're, they're really not equipped for. So I, I want to go back for just a moment to that real life scenario I shared with you just a moment ago. At this particular hospital, all medications were transitioned to this certain biosimilar. So the relay rates happen. And then, of course, you have that $2.4 million loss. So the question becomes, how could PAP, patient assistance programs, how could PAP have stopped that loss? What, what could we have done um, to make a difference? A retroactive review of the drugs administered, that would not have been sufficient. The drug was already given. Um, and, and by the way, the patient assistance programs guidelines for that particular drug require the patient be enrolled and medication be procured prior to the patient's treatment. So at that point, it's too late to affect change with the retroactive review. But then what about the flip side, the pre-procurement of the drug? And on the surface, that may seem like it's the right answer. But in, in this very real life scenario, the patient assistance program would not have approved the patient for enrollment to procure the drug prior to treatment because of the diagnosis code. The diagnosis was not approved and the program itself would not approve off-label drug use for this particular biosimilar. So now what's interesting is the program for the reference drug, they would have covered it, but not the program for the biosimilar. So by the time traditional CAP is involved in the process, the die is already cast and it's too late to affect change. There was no support for alternative formulary adoption to reduce the high cost of drugs. And what may have uh, previously been a slam dunk for PAP is now a miss. And now, once the claims are rejected, that rinse and repeat starts. The five to seven retouches start. There's an increase in administrative burden and the loss of capturable return. So now taking this a step further, traditional PAP addresses self-pay, you're uninsured, and even sometimes um, those patients that are rendered uninsured. Um, but what about, you know, the insured patients, whether they're commercial, whether they're government, um, what about that, that segment of patients and the rising costs that's associated with providing healthcare? You know, um, at Cardinal Health, we've always been an industry leader when it comes to PAP. But even as an industry leader, it was these type of situations, these unique challenges presented by the evolution of healthcare that caused us to really just take a step back to create a program that, addressing the, that addresses these emerging needs. And so just like healthcare evolved, the approach must also evolve beyond PAP. PAP has to evolve into something called advocacy. And so, Laura, can you share with us some of the benefits of um, utilizing this evolved approach? Oh, absolutely. So an evolved approach really puts all of um, the relay, relay race batons in one basket. So really looking at the full utilization of available advocacy programs. 
not just traditional pre-procurement or replacement, but looking beyond that to co-pay assistance, both commercial and nonprofit, looking at advocacy formats that are maybe not medication-based, going all the way back and ensuring that line of sight to remit at the payer level, identifying all of those barriers to the remit process. So as what Anthony spoke of earlier, that the recognition of advocacy truly hinges on whether the insurance is going to pay their portion in that line of sight as they need to. So really removing all of the barriers and hiccups prior to that process. This really has been done to reduce the administrative burden on on-site staff, but as well as provide that reference point not just to prior authorization teams and pre-screening, but to central scheduling. Even as well as looking to the pharmacy side for that just-in-time ordering to be impactful so that we don't have to hold on our shelves seven, eight, and nine different variations of the same drug so that we can truly drill down to target the drugs that we're going to use in the volumes that we're going to use them. That's impactful for controlling the high cost of drugs across the board. This really does look at improving the patient care and outcomes. As a nurse, what drives me is enhancing the mission of our facilities and in increasing the patient experience across the board. We know that applying advocacy significantly reduces bad debt. But I challenge us to also look at advocacy as reducing that unpaid patient balance that goes towards patient experience like very few things in our world can today. A huge portion of what we write off as facilities every year truly is unpaid patient balance. It's staggering to me to think in 2023 how we handle unpaid patient balance in a lot of cases is write off for pennies on the dollar to bad debt, but it truly is our reality. Having a program in place that also looks at supporting alternative formulary adoption in the world of biosimilars or formulary adoption in line of sight to pay or remit. And really in a union that all together as that roadmap that guides our reality for that realization of care. So when we look at best practices for successful advocacy report, as you can tell, this is really multifactorial. There are a lot of things that go into this. But where I really want to begin is a best practice approach and a customized successful program really starts with the augmentation of the current programs that are in place. We're not talking about something that's a replacement for anything in the organization today. This is truly a, a practice that comes in to support and augment what's already there. Support the overwhelming administrative duties that are being shouldered by, oftentimes it's our revenue cycle, in coding queries, in follow-up and rebilling. And sometimes when it gets to revenue cycle, I will tell you from personal experience, I've never met with a revenue cycle director or been one that wouldn't absolutely love to have all of the diagnosis codes inside coding ethics and guidelines to be able to pick up to apply to a claim, to have all of the authorization numbers in place to support that clean claim processing first time every time. And then looking at tracking the value of a program like this, really looking at those things that are truly important to a facility. And then sometimes that's a very unique application. Laura, if I can ask you to go into that just a bit more, how, how are you going to track the value? Well, I think from my perspective, the tracking of value in a program such as we're talking about is not just the obvious, not just the copay assistance dollars or the free medication dollars, although those are hugely important. 
but looking at the amount of denial avoidance that practices like this bring. What's the value of the prior authorization practices that have been brought in to optimize? When looking at those denial avoidance triggers, how many of those were lack of medical necessity? Were they formulary alternatives? Were they payer guideline driven? The analytics that come back in reporting for programs like this really lend to putting the facility back in control of an environment that honestly the payers have maybe made it less than clear what our outcomes would be. Really everything in this is driven to driving down that cost of uncompensated care. Identifying those self-pay patients, those underinsured, those that are rendered underinsured by payer guidelines, or even looking at state governed practices that have gone down to be contractual at the NDC level and not just the Hicks fix or code level. Determining the instance of the un uninsured or underinsured patients so that we can truly target advocacy to where it is most impactful. That's, that's actually really good. Um, looking down at number four, what can advocacy do for your specialty treatment? Um, it, it's really a proactive identification and determination of advocacy that's critical in sustaining our outcome but at the same time, maintaining line of sight to payer remit. Like we talked about earlier, you know, we can request 100,000 copay cards, but if the insurance isn't going to pay, you'll never recognize a dollar of that advocacy. And then the benefit with the outpatient pharmacy is evaluating your standard operating procedures. Um, you wanna ensure that all outpatient pharmacy receives the advocacy and support either in mitigation of white bag practices by supporting clear bagging alternatives, or even knowing that 30% of specialty drugs go unfilled due to actual, or think about this, even perceived costs around the patient's copay. So having the analytics supporting the outcomes in patient specialty pharmacy, it rewrites the world and what we're seeing in success in these areas. And so, Consider partnering with someone that supports your goal and vision of patient care and advocacy. A companion that can design, implement, manage, and augment current on-site practices who can support the overwhelming administrative duties that are being shouldered in revenue cycle today. So let's talk about what it is to apply something like this. Truly getting in the game sooner, looking at the rejected and denied claims and how they take a toll on the revenue cycle process and the overall workflow and efficiencies in this space. Now, not to just drain the slide in front of you, but we all know that hospitals have annual loss for rejected and denied claims. We all know that one in five claim or one in five hospitals lack a bad debt recovery. But I want to talk to you what I see as the three pillars of, of bad debt or uncompensated care found in hospitals. One of those being the traditional uninsured, indigent or rendered uninsured patients. And these are serviced by traditional patient assistance programs in a lot of cases. But the other two areas are wells that we haven't historically tapped into. The second one of those being that patient unpaid balance. Oftentimes it's written off for pennies on the dollar for bad debt. It's staggering just the exact percentage by industry reports of patients that, that are not able to meet that copay or pay that bill. And then looking at that rejected and denied claim, again, honing in on that one third that are unrecoverable even by our best, pra best back in practices. Getting in the game sooner can virtually eliminate those practices. If we know ahead of time the instance of white bagging in site to care and the remit barriers, again, it puts the facility back in control of handling the outcome. So 
So why does getting in the game sooner matter? Let's really start looking at that new approach to offer that proactive or that holistic process. Thanks, Laura, I appreciate that. You know, because when we're looking at a new approach, it does offer that proactive and that holistic process. We're talking about the full utilization of available patient advocacy programs, including prospective free drug, copay assistance, access to charitable grants for all patients. It also reduces uh, administrative burden um, of on-site staff, improves patient care and outcomes, and, and that really enhances uh, your mission of care. And, and here's the deal, it significantly reduces bad debt, and it supports alternative formulary adoption uh, with payer remit. So kind of going back to that example that we used earlier, uh, that, that hospital with the 2.4 million in lost billable uh, due to a formulary change to a biosimilar. If a workflow had been designed that put their advocacy partner in the game earlier, they would have recognized the line of sight to both payer remit and advocacy had been lost. And appropriate alternatives could have been suggested. So, you know, decreasing uh, the rejected and the denied claims and then that rinse and repeat started. But on a separate note, if you notice in the upper right-hand corner, um, for one system, nearly $130 million in patient balance was sent to collections in a 12-month period. Even if a fraction of that could have been um, brought in through best practice advocacy, what would that have meant for the, the P&L, for the bottom line of that facility? That could have potentially been huge. Laura, I'll turn it uh, over to you. So talking about um, the, the proactive revenue cycle management process, um, when, when you're dealing with that, there's really three areas you wanna look at. Your denial avoidance screening. That's what's going to pre prevent your rejected and your denied claims. That's what we mean when we talk about getting in the game sooner or being able to impact change early enough so that it's appreciable and meaningful. Then we're talking absolutely. about, oh, go ahead. Sorry, absolutely right, Anthony. I apologize for the technical difficulty there. Uh, the denial avoidance screening is we're really looking beyond the bounds of that prior authorization, looking at a deep dive into that medical necessity and to that medical guideline clearance, looking at things like site to care, buy and bill, exception, formulary, even that white bagging and payer requirements. And again, today's practices often don't support the intricacies that we find in this area. Secondarily, looking at a robust non-traditional patient advocacy program, again, beyond just basic or traditional retroactive path, looking at holistic advocacy and non-medication-based advocacy to support the entire spectrum of care. When we look, as Anthony was referring to earlier, looking at supporting that biosimilar adoption, preventing unrecoverable utilization, as well as the identification of individual patient white bagging requirements ahead of service, all of these things are rendering in reducing the, den the denied drug costs and unrecognized care. Truly a holistic, comprehensive, and proactive approach has been proven to re deter rejected and denied claims throughout the process. So Laura, we, we really said a whole lot. So let's talk about what's the progression to change? Well, really the progression of change is identifying where the gap is, is where we need to begin. 
So an interesting fact that I want to share with you before the case study is 60% of patients in the hospital outpatient section that don't pay their copay at time of discharge are written off for unpaid balances to bad debt. That's a staggering amount. So if we look at the impact of copays, another case study, 48-year-old male patient that had asthma treated with Zolaire. They had a commercial PPO. Pre-screening practices were in place and completed. The initial claim was denied due to lack of medical necessity because it was coded as asthma, but the clearable diagnosis was moderate to severe asthma. So this delayed that revenue recognition additional time. Now this was rebuilt and paid, but the patient was left with a remaining $3,000 deductible. They had 20% out of pocket maximum allowable charges, and this exceeded $9,500. This was further complicated by the fact that we had a November to January life cycle, so they incurred that deductible, unfortunately, twice. Now, the patient had set up a payment program and arrangements, but life happened, and in the end, it was defaulted and written off to bad debt. The reality of this is through holistic advocacy practices and through that line of sight to remit, we could have remapped the entire reality of this claim. By identifying ahead of time that medical necessity would not have been met by a diagnosis of plain asthma, optimized prior to so that the provider had clearly indicated and ordered for the diagnosis of record, which was moderate to severe as well as assigning commercial copay that would then have taken up the brunt of that $9,500, alleviating the patient from that balance, but also of alleviating the facility of holding that burden. So again, this begins to paint the picture of how we can change the reality and the scope through best practice application. So let's take a look at another um, case study of a large size health system. Um, and when I say large size, I'm, I'm talking about a health system that has uh, 15 hospitals plus. And this really goes back to the relay race that we talked about earlier. Everyone is running at full speed, but your processes, the workflows, payer requirements, all the changes around healthcare itself, it's so easy to become disjointed and, and dollars fall between the cracks and are ultimately lost. But through this proactive approach, we identified opportunities to reduce the lack of medical necessity denials and taking it a step further, it allowed us to identify more than $20 million in additional value. That's additional value with the expansion of the current advocacy program. And additionally, it was identified there was opportunity to expand into uh, unpaid balance prior to write-off. And so truly the outcome here is additional revenue opportunities will continue to increase as new found synergies evolve. And for me personally, it's really amazing to me that through this approach, every time we turn around, there's new areas to partner in to drive value for the patients and those facilities. Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. I don't want you to think that application like this is only viable in large IDNs or large organizations. Because even in medium-sized health systems, looking at four hospitals, 5.8 million to 6.2 million is at risk for one identified hospital in this category. Through the proactive comprehensive analysis, it uncovered patient assistance support providing $1.4 million in added revenue. In looking at this, this is calculatable as a six to one ROI through a proactive model. Laura, I saw that. So how how is a six to one ROI? How is that even possible? Uh, you look at it through many factors. Obviously, it's, it is the identification of free medication as, as a value as well, both proactive and retroactive. It's the identification recognition of uh, copay assistance in all of the other forms of advocacy. But it's also looking at maybe some of those 
um, areas of denial avoidance, optimization that it wasn't 60, 90, and 120 days prior to recognizing those revenues. Looking at what you touched on earlier, driving down the cost of unpaid patient balance prior to write-off, as well as not having the amount of denials and coding queries on the books. All of these things really add up to extremely significant ROI for partners. We also want to look at what this looks like for rural hospitals, critical access, or small community-based hospitals. This is applicable here as well. We all experience the pain points in healthcare. We just often experience them a little differently. So if we look at a 40 bed community hospital, it still had a 923 to $1 million at risk value. Through proactive comprehensive processing and implement, implemented including patient assistance program, even here we had a five to one ROI with a proactive model. This truly went a long way to increase that facility's cash flow and support of their on-site teams. We all know that in rural America, often we feel the barrier of having enough staff to go around, maybe in different ways than most. So when we look at this and when we begin to unpack everything we've talked about, in these examples and throughout our discussion, we've highlighted the opportunity for the need for change, the proactive approach to really rethink that revenue cycle. This program has been proven to reduce the amount of rejected and denied claim instances up to 80% through workflow efficiency, minimizing time spent corrected the rejected and denied claims. Truly the easiest denial to overturn is the one that never happened. Relieving that administrative burden for patient-centered on-site teams. You can see how practices like this go a long way to reducing the rejected and denied claims, strengthening that revenue cycle process. But as the nurse in me, the one true area is supporting that care mission, decreasing that patient financial burden and increasing our community outreach to our partners. This solution enhances that process and handoff between the stakeholders. And our support is fully HIPAA compliant and it is designed to complement all EHRs because no interface here is required. That's significant. So as we're coming to a close on this portion of our webinar, proactive practices are central to changing the status quo. So really, what's the next step? It starts with really taking an honest look at where things are today. Is there truly a proactive approach at my facility? We want to review the revenue and reimbursement process. Um, consider areas for improvement, then assess your capabilities and support needs. Even, even the silos, because the silos themselves can create breakdowns and, and loss of uh, resources and, and cash. Um, and then consider the, your resources. If an organization lacks the necessary internal resources, an outside partner like us, Cardinal Health, we can lead the effort. We can complete uh, the historic cleans audit. We can improve workflow efficiencies across your hospital's matrix organization. We can identify the maximum patient advocacy for as many of your patients um, as possible. And so um, if you want to learn more, Laura and I are always available. Um, you want to learn more, visit uh, www.cardinalhealth forward slash rethink revenue process. Now it's important, remember that's a forward slash www.cardinalhealth.com slash revenue processes. And so um, with that, I wanna turn it back over to Amanda, our moderator. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you both for your excellent presentation. So this now brings us to the Q&A portion of the program. So we would now like to invite you to ask live questions of our speakers. 
So as a reminder, mm -hmm. to submit a question, click on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your console player. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. Please note that your questions will remain anonymous and will not be viewable by other audience members. So our first question is, how do we enhance synergies across different disciplines? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. Sure. How do we enhance synergies across different disciplines? Well, when I think about synergies across disciplines, think about um, how we can enhance the handoff between either our specialty outpatient oncology, rheumatology, or in our clinical aspect or how we can, we can promote the handoff to either internal specialty pharmacy um, or across disciplines inside the organization between central scheduling, prior authorization, and revenue cycle. Anthony, do you have anything to add there? I, I think what you said was great. Um, you know, just thinking about everything going back to the relay race you know, being able to break down those silos and really create a proactive um, organization with workflows that really allows that capturable return. Great. So with the increase of site to care changes and the regulations around buy and bill, how does this approach help mitigate these challenges? Well, this approach is integral to the management of those challenges and changes. It becomes inherent for an organization to truly understand and know where that line of sight to remit is coming from. If you have a barrier in sight to care, sometimes you can be one to two, if not three administrations in before you realize you didn't have the right to buy and bill or you couldn't infuse a patient in hospital outpatient setting. It's inherent that even through the recognition of advocacy, as we spoke about, that insurance has to pay its portion. So we must get that site here correct. Anthony? That's one of those ones where I'll say enough said, because I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that one. Great. So is this meant to replace our current front end practices? Absolutely, it doesn't. The front end practices in every facility are an integral part of what we do. What this is meant to do is this is meant to support, augment and bolster those practices. Because as payers change their guidelines and put additional hurdles in our place every day, we are having to find ways to fill those gaps and mitigate those outcomes. We're not looking to replace what's already there. We're just looking to kind of um, support it for a more holistic application. Anthony, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, that, that's a really great point. Because Laura, I think you mentioned this earlier, you know, uh, the overwhelming administrative duties of our revenue cycle teams, you know, they, they don't have enough heads to wear more hats. And so being able to come in and provide that additional support, not to replace, but to your point, augment what's currently there, help really help the helper uh, be more meaningful and impact in saving dollars and reducing those denied and rejected claims. So the goal is to augment and support and really be able to partner um, for the, the organization's vision for the patients. Great. So what are the standard KPIs that are used to track a program like this? And what is the right way to view success? Well, Anthony and I probably um, can both address that. But standard KPIs around a program like this are really individually created with each facility. Although we have some standards in KPIs that we always track, but I would look at the benchmark of going in for a program like this. What was the percentage of claims that initially faced denial prior to the implementation of this program? And at six months and a year, what were the percentage that you're seeing now? Ideally, you would see that drastically reduce. Same to be said for your indication of upheld denial. Likely what would be seen for patient unpaid balance or write off to bad debt. All of these should decrease. 
as well as looking at the formulary adoption around biosimilars and had the effect, the effect that that has on the overall drug costs. Now, Anthony, I'll let you address where you would see accumulators in the patient assistance and advocacy from that side. Absolutely. And, and Laura, to your point earlier, just really quick, um, the, the trends that you call out are critical and being able to see how those trends are changing over a period of time. And we would really want to see that also with um, some of the more traditional um, forms of advocacy, like your drug replacement, your drug procurement. So we want to take a look at your acquisition cost of that drug. And then we want to be able to provide you with a monthly score of this is the value of those drugs that were received. And we also want to track not just the uh, copay award amount or the grant and foundation award amount, but we want to track the amount that was dispersed. And so that really begins to show you how well um, your facility is functioning. Those KPIs are giving you a snapshot on a monthly basis as to what you're looking at for your facility. Great, so how does this differ from other RCM products in the market? And is it the same thing? Well, I guess I would challenge you to say that this is not a product that is an RCM management. This is something that although has revenue cycle aspects, this is not revenue cycle management. This is more that preparation for revenue cycle to function optimally. You know, this is that rolling in of advocacy and free drug and really a holistic program that supports every opportunity found through there. From the ordering of the drug at the, at the pharmacy level to the optimization of formulary standard, but again, probably one of the biggest areas is preparing all of this to go into revenue cycle to support them at the top of their application. Anthony, more to add there? Yes, I, I don't know if you guys remember at the very beginning when I was telling you my, my son, um, my first introduction into PAP was when my son was born and we didn't have insurance. And so there was a small clinic that we went to and they, they helped us. Um, when I started doing PAP after that, I went back to see if I can help out that clinic. That clinic had closed. And when I got a hold of some of the people that um, worked in that clinic, I asked them, you know, what was going on? They said, we were writing off so much. There was so much bad debt that we could not um, continue to keep our doors open. And I remember asking them, um, is that something that PAP or advocacy could have helped with it. Said, yeah, it really could have. We just didn't have the manpower. We didn't have the knowledge. And we didn't, we didn't necessarily know how to run something like that. And so we're, we're certainly not looking to uh, replace or change, but again, to go back and augment, where there's, there's really nothing on the market like what we've evolved into. This is really a um, one-of-a-kind First in class solution that really partners with you and tailor makes a um, workflow that makes sense for your particular facility or system. So it's not to replace, it's always meant to augment. And again, there's nothing like it on the market. Wow, interesting. Thanks for sharing that story, Anthony. Um, well, that's all the time we have uh, for questions today. And I want to thank Laura and Anthony once again for an excellent presentation and our sponsor, Cardinal Health, for making this program possible. Finally, thank you and our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Health Leaders webinar. And this concludes today's program.